Hello everyone and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. Today we are here with the newspaper of 24th of March 2024 and let's have a discussion on all the topics that we have. Now today we have relatively less number of articles to discuss. There are these two articles that we are going to discuss in detail. All right. These are the ones that we are going to discuss in detail. Both related to couple of high uh, problems that we have diseases that we often see in the news where we see that there are certain government initiatives as well one is with regards to tuberculosis and the second one is regard to with regarding uh, anemia so we'll discuss about these two diseases then from the prelims perspective these are the two articles one with regard to what china has been doing in the south china sea and then a new theory with regard to the dispersal out of africa theory so we'll discuss about these two from prelims perspective and then from the perspective of revisited highlights we have navy steps up vigil, vigil among piracy threat now again something which is in the context of the red sea crisis that we have been often discussing in the past few months so these are the important articles that we are going to discuss in today's session so let's begin with the first session or the first topic and this is about Activists write to PM highlighting shortage of vital anti-TB drugs. Now, here when we are talking about this article, we need to understand the various aspects of TB first and there are things that have been given in this article. So let's try to understand what the article says and then we'll also go on to the basics and the background of the entire thing that we have in India. Now overall, when what we see is that the activists and also a lot of public health experts and also apart from that a lot of so if you see this that activists and public health experts TB survivors and individuals with HIV they all have written a, a letter to our Prime Minister and they have requested that it there is an intervention that is required to ensure that the shortage of anti TB drugs can be taken care of and this is also in the context of the fact that March 24th is also seen as World Tuberculosis Day. Now in this letter they have actually emphasized that there is an ongoing shortage of the medications and especially when it comes to the drug sensitive tuberculosis. This is where we need to take care of that aspect and we'll discuss about what do we mean by drug sensitive tuberculosis a little later. Now in this case specifically there are certain drugs that have been mentioned by them so for example these are the drugs that they have mentioned in their letter that this is where we actually need to take care of the shortage now overall when it comes to the entire scenario of all these drugs what we also see is that there is uh, that what they have also highlighted is that the national tb elimination program has and uh, in this context what the group has highlighted is that the national TB elimination program uh, the acknowledgement that a continuous supply of quality assured TB drugs is very very crucial for the entire DOTS strategy that India has and they also at the same time pointed out uh, a kind of improperly managed treatment contribution uh, that also contributes to the emergence of the drug resistant TB strains in India. And at the same time, they also stress that most of the significant impact of the drug shortage is on the individuals currently undergoing the TB treatment in India. And that's why we see that there are a lot of interruptions in their uh, treatment as well. And at the same time, that it can also develop a lot of drug resistance in these cases. So that's why it has all been highlighted uh, in this article. These are the things that have been pointed out by uh, the activists now let's also try to understand some of the issues uh, when it comes to TB and why are we talking about all these issues let's try to understand that so first when it comes to tuberculosis tuberculosis is basically a serious infectious diseases that primarily affects the lungs but at the same time can also affect other parts of the body and it is something which is called caused by a bacterium which is called as mycobacterium tuberculosis and that's why the name comes from there now overall when it comes to tb tb has seen as one of the top 10 causes of deaths worldwide 
and that's when it poses a very significant health challenge and especially when it comes to the low and middle income countries now in this context when we look at some of the key features of tuberculosis what we see is that first when it comes to the transmission for example the transmission of tb it can spread from person to person through air and that's why when an infected person coughs or sneezes or even talks or spits then in that case there are chances that they propel the tb bacteria into air and a person then needs and anyone who is in the vicinity if they inhale this then even they can be infected so that's why the transmission when it comes to the transmission of this disease transmission of this disease transmission you can say that this is like a droplet infection because the droplets uh, that will be uh, propelled out of somebody's body that can lead to tuberculosis now in this case when it comes to tb we see that there are different types of tb first example when we have when we look at the infection with tb uh, it can either lead to something called as latent tb or also called as active tb so on one hand we have latent tb and then we have active tb latent tb and active tb now most people uh, which who are uh, who are infected with the bacteria they actually have latent tb meaning that they are not ill and they cannot transmit the disease and without treatment however what we see is that 5 to 10% of these individuals they actually start developing active tb as well now this active tb can be even fatal if it has not been treated properly so that's why the symptoms of active tb is something that we need to understand where we see that it can be a persistent cough that can last for maybe 3 or 4 weeks or even more than that and maybe while somebody is coughing even blood can uh, come up while coughing it can also lead to chest pain or weight loss fatigue fever night sweats uh, chills and even loss of appetite so there are all these things that can happen in case of active tb all right so active tb there will be prolonged cough prolonged cough chest pain fatigue fever so it can lead to all these things and at the same time it can also lead to even loss of appetite and even uh, there can be night chills etc so all these things actually can happen in case of uh, the active tb so there are all these things and when it comes to the diagnosis of this tb the diagnosis of the tb is done by a various different methods for example there are blood tests skin test the x ray of the chest and also we see that uh, the examination of the sputum also can be done and it can also uh, be treat, uh, diagnosed with all these things now overall when it comes to the treatment of tb we know that treatment of tb is possible that it is curable and uh, there is a standard 6 month course of there are four different active uh, antimicrobials that are actually used and there is a 6 month course that we have uh, of those antimicrobials and that's why that can help in treatment of uh, tb but without treatment just remember that tb can be fatal if not treated so that's why for prevention and control we see that there are vaccinations for example bcg vaccine is partially effective in uh preventing tb you might have heard of the bcg vaccine so we have this bcg vaccine that can help in uh controlling of tb at the same time what we see is that uh, the effectiveness of uh, bcg although is very variable in uh, adults so overall all these things are there and apart from that we also see that there are a lot of public health measures also that are taken to ensure that the high risk of active tb that we have especially in the low and middle income countries they can also be reduced so that's why there are different techniques that are used to ensure that we can uh, drop down the number of cases that we have right now now overall in case of tb we know that these are some of the important points with regard to tb but when it comes to understanding what's happening in india and how do we see 
tuberculosis in the context of India, understanding certain points becomes very, very crucial. Because we see that tuberculosis in India is present in very several critical issues. And that's why it has also reflected a very complex interplay of public health and socio-economic factors and also some of the challenges related to the healthcare system in India. So for example, when you uh, talk about the prevalence rate uh, in India, we see that there is a very high burden of disease in India. India has the highest burden of TB in the world according to uh, uh, which accounts for almost you can say almost one fourth of the total number of TB cases that are there uh, globally. So that's why there is a very high burden of disease. At the same time, the incident rate that we see in TB, we see that there are estimates that there are more than a million new cases of TB in India every year. So that's why first is that almost 25% of global cases are in India. Then a million plus cases every year so that's another issue that we need to understand and at the same time we see that although it is a curable disease we have seen that it causes significant mortality also in india and more than thousands of deaths annually happen uh, because of tb so that's why from perspective of india we have to understand this also that it need leads to thousands of deaths annually so that's why for india it becomes a challenge and in this regard there is something called as drug resistant tb now what we see is that there is an emergence and stress, uh, a spread of drug resistant tb lately where there are two specific types that become very crucial to understand one called as multi-drug resistant tb and the other one called as extensively drug resistant tb so we have two types, one called as multi-drug resistant TB and the other one is called as extensively drug resistant TB. So we see that the number of cases of these two variants have been increasing of late. So that's why and we'll discuss about MDR and XDR TB also. And at the same time we see that there are a lot of complexities especially when it comes to the MDR and XDR TB and their effects also can be very severe and some of the common drugs may not work in case of MDR and XDR TB. So that's why we see that there are a lot of socioeconomic factors that are leading to these kind of issues in India. We know that uh, some of the issues related to the population or the overcrowding that we have in the country that leads to it, contributes to it, poverty also contributes to it. So that's why there are these socioeconomic factors. And then also at the same time we see that there are a lot of other problems with regard to the stigma and the discrimination that we see uh, whether it is uh, also related to let's say the delay in the uh, healthcare seeking behavior so there are all these problems that we also have and that's why it leads to healthcare system challenges as well we see that the access to very rapid diagnostic tests is very uh, tests are very limited in india and that's why that also leads to delay in the start of the appropriate treatment so absence absence of rapid tests so that's why this leads to delay in start of treatment delay in the start of the treatment then after that we see that there are other challenges for example something that has been highlighted in this article also that there are periodic shortages of essential anti-TB drugs as well and this also disrupts the treatment regimens and that's why it poses a lot of treatment uh, interruptions and at the same time also in the development of drug resistance as well. So that's why it becomes very crucial for us to un understand and address the shortage of drugs. shortage of anti-TB drugs. So that's why this is also something that we need to understand and monitor well. So that's why surveillance and monitoring becomes very crucial that we need to ensure that there are timely interventions and control of TB spreads that are uh, being taken care of by us. Now apart from that there are another there is another issue and that is with regard to the HIV co-infection. 
we have seen that the individuals who have HIV they are significantly more susceptible to TB due to the compromised immune system that they possess. So that's why we see that they are at a higher risk altogether. And that's why there are certain co-management challenges as well. That when it comes to TB or HIV co-infection, which are present in ad as additional challenges for the treatment and management, this is where we need to understand that there is a need for integrated care strategies as well. So that's why in this case we need uh, integrated care strategies. Integrated, integrated care strategies, right? So because the co-infection rates in the HIV patients of TB is higher. Now when it comes to some of the government initiatives, we see that there is the national TB elimination program that we have and this is where India aims to eliminate TB by 2025. So, TB elimination by 2025 and this is as a part of national TB elimination program. So national TB elimination program NTEP. Now uh, this is where we are trying to be ahead of the global targets because we also realize that we have a huge burden of TB and that's why the program actually has been focusing on early detection and treatment and addressing all the social determinants of health as well at the same time. Then we also have something called as the DOTS strategy. <coughs> Sorry. Where we know that directly observed treatment short course or DOTS strategy is something that has been taken as a part of NTEP and it tries to ensure that the patients receive the correct dose of medication under the supervision of a healthcare worker or a trained volunteer in terms of TB. So that's why, <coughs> sorry, this DOTS strategy becomes very, very crucial in this regard. So overall that's why uh, all these things have to be understood. One more topic that can be related to all this discussion of TB is MDR and XDR TB. Now MDR TB that is something which is uh, resistant to at least you can say uh, uh, different types of uh, different types of drugs that are used. So most of the I mean there are two most potent TB drugs that are being used here. And that's why we see that it is something which actually has a resistance to these two drugs. So that's why, so one is isoniazide and the other one is rifampicin. So these two drugs, I'll just write it here. So there are two drugs against which we see that MDR-TB is completely resistant. So, so one is isoniazide, isoniazide is one drug and rifampicin. Pisin is the other drug, Rifam Pisin. So these are the two drugs which, uh, these are the two most potent drugs against TB. And what we see is that MDR actually starts to become resistant against this, these two drugs. So that's why this form of TB arises due to improper use of antibiotics during the treatment or maybe incorrect pre prescription or the patient not completing the full course of the treatment. So that's why it can uh, lead, uh, happen because of that or at the same time it may also happen because of transmission of TB strains directly from one individual to another. So that's why we see that uh, the treatment for MDR-TB becomes very complicated because it becomes drug sensitive. Uh, that's why it will uh, then other drug sensitive TB that we have and it requires a longer duration of treatment altogether. Sometimes it can need up to 24 months of treatment regime to be followed. And uh, a lot of second line and uh, second line anti-TB drugs are also required. And that's why we see that it can become very expensive also to treat MDR-TB. Then the second one is XDR-TB. So XDR-TB we see that this is called as extensively drug resistant TB and in this case we see that there are a lot of other kinds of uh, drugs and injections also uh, or the second line drugs also where it actually does not uh, show any uh, I mean it becomes resistant to all the others as well. So not only isoniazid and the rifam 
space in but we see that apart from that the so these two plus you can say the second line drugs the second line drugs or injections that are used that's the case of xdr tb that it will actually be resistant to all these as well so that's why we see that when it comes to xdr tb it can arise from xdr tb through further mismanagement or inappropriate treatment so that's why it can lead to all this and that's why this xdr tb becomes extremely difficult to treat due to the resistance that it that it has to the first line and the more potent second line drugs as well and that's why the treatment options here are very very limited and often very less effective and that's why it can uh, the treatment regime can last up to 3 years or 36 months or even more than that and that's why at the same time what we see is that the treatment side effects can also be very severe and that's why successful uh, success rates in xdr tb is pretty low and even lower than as compared to what we see with mdr tb so that's why there are these complexities with regard to mdr and xdr tb that we need to understand in this entire interplay now coming to the second article uh, that we have on the science page that is anemia prevalence in eight states found to be overestimated now this is uh, an article that we have on page number 12 and in page number 12 the article basically uh, has talked about a certain aspect of anemia that there was a comprehensive study that was actually conducted across eight indian states where we saw that there were more than 4600 participants there were more than 4600 participants and where we understood that the previous anemia prevalence estimates were actually overstated and that's why unlike the prior surveys that used used the capillary blood here we see that there was a different method that was uh, used and that's why direct uh, uh, the uh, venous blood for hemoglobin measurement was being done this time so that better or more accurate results can be achieved so overall what we understood is that when it comes to the prevalence of anemia prevalence of anemia was primarily mild uh, with overall estimates of approximately you can see 18.4% mildly anemic 14.7 moderately and 1.8% severely and here they found that women had higher anemia rates rates as compared to uh, the uh, to men now overall what we understand is that the previous survey that was done in the previous survey they had shown rates to be higher as compared to this particular study so that's why we are talking about this under uh, a problem that we see that overall we see that the highest prevalence rate of anemia were observed in assam and odisha while meghalaya and telangana all had the lowest numbers now overall when we come to this we understand that uh, iron deficiency actually has accounted for 18.4% of all the anemia cases and that's why it has challenged the assumption that we really have that the primary cause of assumption uh, pri primary cause of anemia in india is iron deficiency so that's why uh, the study has suggested that there should be a reevaluation of iron supplementation policies due to the risk of excess iron as well and that's why it has also recommended uh, that we should focus on reducing the inflammation and also try to increase the dietary diversity in, in the individuals so that's why we see that there are all these things that have been brought forward and in this particular regard what also has been suggested by dr kurpat is that there should be a shift towards uh, better diets and understanding how exactly we can look into uh, bringing better resilience so for example millets so millets is something that has been highlighted in um, in uh, this aspect and in response to the diminishing nutritional value of the cereals which are caused by climate change so there are all these things also that have been uh, advocated and at the same time broadening the approach for anemia prevention so that uh, there are other aspects that we have to consider that various nutritional deficiencies and environmental factors beyond iron deficiency also can lead to anemia so first thing is that when it comes to anemia what do we mean by anemia so anemia you know it's a condition that is characterized by deficiency in the number of quality 
नंबर और क्वालिटी ऑफ रेड ब्लड सेल्स इन द बॉडी और रिडक्शन इन हेमोग्लोबिन कॉन्सेंट्रेशन विद इन दो सेल्स ना ओवरऑल वॉट हैपन्स इज दैट वी सी दैट देर विल बी अ डिफिशियंसी ऑफ हिमोग्लोबिन और ब्लड मेकिंग अबिलिटी ऑफ द ब्लड बॉडी स्टार्ट टू डिमिनिश and in this regard we know that hemoglobin becomes very crucial because hemoglobin as you know is a protein that we have in the red blood cells and hemoglobin would carry the oxygen from the lungs to the rest of the body and that's why when it comes to anemia the body doesn't get enough of oxygen rich blood and this is where it leads to a lot of symptoms such as fatigue or uh, weakness so all these fatigue or weakness pale or yellowish skin irregular heart beats shortness of breath dizziness cold hands and feet so there are all these things that can happen as a part of anemia and that's why there are various different causes a uh, variety of causes from where anemia can actually develop one of the most prominent causes always has been seen as iron deficiency so one of the most prominent causes always has been seen as iron deficiency iron deficiency and then apart from iron deficiency uh, most common called worldwide has been seen to be iron deficiency lack of iron in the body uh, which becomes very crucial for hemoglobin production because iron only leads to hemoglobin production and that's why if there is no iron then hemoglobin production starts to decrease then apart from that uh, it can also be because of shortage of vitamin b12 deficiency of vitamin b12 now vitamin b12 is very essential for the production of red blood cells and a lack of these nutrients can also lead to decrease red blood cell production as well so that's why vitamin b12 becomes very crucial in this aspect and uh, uh, if we do not have vitamin enough of vitamin b then in that case what happens is that uh, the production of red blood cells will start to decrease and we'll see that uh, there will be a lot of issues related to hemoglobin also that will start to happen from here on now overall what we see is that there are other aspects as well so for example uh, some of the conditions like kidney failure or inflammatory inflammatory diseases or at the same time even cancer can also interfere with the production of the red blood cells so that's why there are other chronic diseases as well all right so other chronic diseases can also lead to anemia so in this case it could be because of cancer all right it could be because of other diseases for example it even can come from kidney failure or other inflammation so other inflammatory diseases it can also lead to anemia so there are all these causes at the same time we see that uh, an increased rate of blood uh, uh, blood cell destruction can also happen and that also is something which is also called as hemolysis so there is a case of hemolysis as well hemolysis now in case of hemolysis what happens is that the cell destruction happens at a quicker rate and that can also lead to anemia then there are other problems for example it can be also related to bone marrow problems as well so so we see that some of the conditions that affect the bone marrow can also lead to decrease production of uh, red blood cells so that also has to be seen as a problem similarly there are genetic conditions as well so problems in the bone marrow problems in the bone marrow and then it can be because of genetic conditions as well so for example if you have heard of sickle cell anemia or thalassemia so these are basically caused by the production of abnormally shaped or dysfunctional uh, hemoglobin so the red blood cell has a shape of a sickle so that's why it is called as sickle cell anemia so sick in sickle cell i mean anemia also we see that the the production or largely the transportation of the red blood cells also becomes very very the difficult and that also starts to cause a lot of issues so that's why all these things can actually lead to anemia now when it comes to understanding of what's happening in india and how anemia is related to india we see that in case of india anemia is very highly prevalent across all the age groups and genders in india and that's why when it comes to the previous survey that we were talking about the national family health survey so if you remember we discussed here 
that in the previous case of uh, National Family Health Survey, it had showed that the prevalence rate of anemia in India were much higher. So they had basically talked about that there is a very high prevalence rate of anemia in India and that's why we understand that a significant proportion of the Indian population has been suffering from anemia with higher rates among women and children. So that's why women and children have been seen to be at a higher risk. So anemia, what we see is that anemia affects a large group of women and particularly when it comes to uh, pregnant and lactating women and also the children who are under the age of 5 years. This is where we see that we have a significant threat for the maternal and child health and that's why it also in, uh, increases the risk of mortality also weakening the immune system and also can also impair a lot of cognitive development in the children. So that's why we have to understand that why in case of women and children so especially we see that in case of pregnant and lactating women and also <coughs> children under 5 years of age. So children under 5 years of age, this is where we have seen that the, pre uh, the prevalence rate is higher of anemia. Then when we understand the nutritive deficiencies, we understand that iron deficiency is the most common cause of anemia but deficiency of some of the other nutrients such as vitamin B12 or folate and also vitamin A can also contribute to high rates of anemia in India. So that's why these deficiencies are very often due to inadequate dietary habits and intake and also maybe uh, less uh, nutritive food available to a lot of poor population in the country. So that's why we see that there are all these issues. So nutritive deficiencies wise, it can be because of iron, it can be because of vitamin B12 or folate and even in cases it can be because of uh, vitamin A as well. So that's why we have to understand that there are socio-economic factors as well including poverty or lack of education and also limited uh, access to healthcare. Uh, these all things also increase the risk and in the impact of anemia altogether and at the same time dietary practices which are influenced by also cultural beliefs and also at times uh, economic status all these things also play a very crucial rate in increasing the prevalence rate of uh, anemia in India. Now today we see that there are uh, government initiatives as well so for example last year if you remember last year we had announced that we'll be looking towards a complete elimination of uh, sickle cell anemia in India by 2047. So that's why now we have a program specifically targeted towards sickle cell anemia and that's why other forms of anemia also we see that there are regular uh, interventions by the government where we are trying to reduce the burden of anemia related issues in the country. Now let's look at the prelims articles for today. The first article that we have is Chinese forces hit Filipino both with water cannons. Now in this context what we basically are discussing is what's happening in the South China Sea where we see that the Chinese Coast Guard ships they actually attacked a Philippines boat with water cannon where, uh, and this is where we see that they use water cannons against a Philippines supply boat alright uh, it was a Philippines supply boat that was there and we see that this is something that again uh, in the South China Sea, it has uh, also led to injury in the Navy crew members and also has caused heavy damage to the vessel. Now overall what we have seen is that the United States and Japan, they have expressed their support for Philippines in this uh, scenario and they have expressed their concerns over the Chinese forces aggression and uh, in, in the cases of the islands that, which are very significant in this particular area. Now overall when it comes to uh, the particular scenario we are talking about the second Thomas Shoal Islands and in this case we see that there has been an extended support from the US and Japan. Now overall when it comes to this island we know that this island has been occupied by the Philippines Navy since 1999 and uh, 
this is where we see that all the tension in which has happened in the territorial standoff surrounding Chinese Coast Guard and also we have seen that there have been a lot of militia uh, vessels also that actually have been seen in this particular area. So overall now when it comes to this we understand that there it more or less is the second attack that we have seen and uh, from the Chinese side and Chinese coast guards also have last time also they had used water cannons for the assault. Now the ongoing concentrations that we see at the sea they actually have also raised a lot of fear escalation um, raised a concern with regard to the fear of escalation into a larger conflict that might happen and potentially involving China and the United States at the same time. Now overall we know that it, it becomes a very complex issue altogether because US does not have any claims altogether when it comes to South China Sea but uh, it conducts freedom of navigation operations with the Navy ships and fighter jets and this is something that is criticized by China a lot of times. So that's why we see that so this when it comes to the freedom of navigation operations that we see here it very often leads to uh, problems between these two countries and the US actually has reiterated its obligation towards defending Philippines as its oldest treaty ally in Asia. Uh, that's why uh, especially in the against the armed attacks that we have seen in the South China Sea uh, including from all the different participants. So that's why when you look at the South China Sea it becomes a very complex scenario altogether because you have all these countries and you can see um, on the board that all these countries they have their claim when it comes to uh, the South China Sea. So for example when it comes to China we know that China is there in the north and the northeast at the same time you also have Taiwan and Taiwan claims the entire South China Sea uh, and that's why and through its claim on the Spartley Islands as well which have been very crucial in this regard and that's why this is also one of the challenges that we have. So if you just uh, notice you'll see that China, Taiwan uh, almost asking for the entire of South China Sea and then Malaysia also asks or claims over certain parts of the South China Sea. Then you also have Vietnam that also wants control over the South China Sea. So you have Philippines to the east, you have Malaysia and Malaysia lies to the southwest, uh, sorry, southeast parts and that's why we see that uh, 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 we also have Bruni Islands also here. So Bruni also uh, has some claims over this part as you can see that it also claims a part of the South China Sea and then so there are all these uh, countries that you have. So only country that does not claim anything here is Indonesia. That Indonesia in this regard you will see that Indonesia does not claim anything as such but others, other than that all the other countries they have been claiming a part of the South China Sea. So that's why we see that there are all these issues and overall we have seen that there have been a lot of issues with regard to the territorial claims for example. A lot of issues with regard to the territorial claims that we have seen and that's why all these countries whether China, Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, Taiwan they all have been claiming sovereignty over various islands and reefs that we have um, in this particular scenario and also the shoals that you have in the South China Sea and that's why the most extensive claim here is made by China and there is something which is called as the nine dash line. So there is something called as the nine dash line which is basically the Chinese claim line the red colored line that you see here. So Overall we see that uh, it is something that overlaps with the maritime zones that have been claimed by some of the other countries as well. So we see that the disputes also have been arising over the maritime rights and access including who would have the fishing rights or the exploration and the exploitation of the resources that we have. Even for example oil and gas resources that we have here. So and, and that's why they, they also claim that there should be a freedom of navigation that they should have. So very often we have seen that the UN clause have uh, reference these disputes through a lot of 
uh, interpretations and claims and we see that these problems are nowhere getting solved right now and everywhere we see that there is a lot of militarization that has happened and it has raised a lot of security concerns that the militarization of the disputed islands uh, and the features for example construction of the military installations and air strips particularly by China has escalated a lot of tension and that's why these developments actually have raised concerns potentially for the military conflict and impact it can impact regional security and dynamics of that region now overall we understand that these are challenges that we have and especially my uh, let's be very honest that when it comes to china for china the entire world is china so there is nothing that it that is not china so they claim everything to their east to their west to the south to their north whatever they can claim they claim if uh, if the other countries were not strong enough to oppose the entire world would not be called as a world but rather would be called as china so anyway so coming to the next article dispersal out of africa may have occurred during arid period now what exactly so there is something called as out of africa theory and we'll discuss about out of africa theory particularly in the context of this article so there are uh, these things that have been mentioned according to a study and what the study says is that the disposal that we are seeing the recent uh, widespread human migration out of africa which was happening uh, which would have happened almost 1 lakh years ago is suggested to have coincided with the arid period following the so if you if you go to the context so less than 1 lakh years ago might have occurred during an arid period post the toba super volcano eruption contra contradicting the belief that only humid humid periods facilitated such migration now overall it has been suggested to have coincided that's why with arid period following the toba super volcano eruption and this is a study that has been uh, mentioned in the journal nature so according to a study that has been published in journal nature it this is particularly what has been seen and contrary to the common belief that only human uh, sorry only the humid periods would have facilitated human migration out of africa through some green corridors this study actually has proposed that an uh, arid period may have actually enabled this migration and that's why evidences from the site in the northwest of utopia uh, ethiopia sorry uh, has been actually uh suggesting that this actually may have uh, because there are a lot of uh, uh evidences that they have found that there are stone tools and there are animal remains etc all these things have been found near ethiopia now in this particular scenario in this particular scenario what we basically are believing is that it might indicate that there was human presence around 74000 years ago during the middle stone age and that's why from this perspective what it is saying is that when we do the chemical analysis of the glass shards that we have in the sediment samples they also have confirmed that the origin of the toba super eruption uh, and also the isolation uh, of the other studies that we have done of the ostrich egg cells etc and the fossil mammal teeth that they have found it all also suggests that uh, this environment altogether here would have been very dry at this particular uh, period and that's why it also uh, talks about the increased reliance on the fishing in the rivers uh, so that's why there are all these things that they have talked about and this scenario might have uh, transformed seasonal rivers into something called as the blue highway corridors which might have facilitated the out of africa uh, uh, migration of the species from here on or of the humans from here on so that's why Uh, the adapted the adaptability that has been shown by humans in exploiting of the resources under the conditions under the arid conditions after the super uh, eruption would have been very crucial for the survival and that's why also for the expansion of the species outside africa and also for the adaptation that they have done to the diverse climates that are there worldwide now what we are basically discussing here is something called as the out of africa theory the out of africa theory basically is also something which is also called as the recent african origin model which is widely accepted hypothesis 
uh, when it comes to the understanding of the paleo paleo anthropology that proposes that all the modern humans all right all the modern humans might have originated in africa so what it basically says is that uh, all the modern humans may have common ancestry in africa and they might have evolved from the homo from homo sapien populations that existed approximately 2 lakh to 3 lakh years ago now the migration patterns basically according to the theory what it suggests is that there would be uh, there would have been early humans that began migrating out of africa several in several waves and that these waves they start 70000 to 1 lakh years uh, ago and eventually it might have spread to the rest of the world from here on and the migration would have led to colonization of all the continents except for antarctica and then also the replacement or assimilation of all the existing hominoid species that might we might have had in these kind of areas so when we call uh, when we talk about for example the denisovans so replacement of these denisovans might have happened or or neanderthals so the denisovans and these species or the other hominoids they might have been replaced by uh, the homo sapiens that started coming out of africa and there have been genetic evidences also that the theory also has been supported by a lot of genetic studies which have also shown the highest level of genetic diversity in the african population which is consistent with all the longer periods of human evolution that we have seen in wider continents as well so that's why when we look at the studies of uh, the dna the especially the mitochondrial dna because if you know about mitochondrial dna mitochondrial dna is supposed to be common across all the species of of a certain species for example every human so when we talk about dna generally we say that dna is found inside the nucleus so inside the nucleus the dna that you have are the dna that are common across uh, that are individually uh, only limited to that individual all right so dna you either have inside the nucleus or you have inside the mitochondria now the one that we have inside one that we have inside the nucleus is specific to us so my nuclear dna will be different from your nuclear dna but the mitochondrial dna is common across this one particular species that all the humans would have similar mitochondrial dna so that's why when we do the analysis of the mitochondrial dna and especially also some of the y chromosomes they have traced back humans to the african ancestors so that's why we see that this out of africa theory there are fossil records also including the skulls and the skeleton remains that we have found in africa they have been seen to be among the oldest evidences of the modern homo sapiens that we have seen and that's why it also supports the idea that humans originated there before the migration that happened to other parts of the world so that's why there are all these things that we have done there are ar archaeological findings in africa as well there are tools and arts that we have found and that also has indicated towards the early signs of cultural and technological innovations that might have started happening in the modern humans in africa so this entire thing this is called as the out of africa theory now coming to a revisited article and this is about the navy ships steps up a vigil amid piracy threats now what we basically are discussing here is that there are 35 pirates who were captured from the vessel that the name of the vessel being ruel now from here during a 40 hour operation and that's why they were then brought to mumbai for prosecution by the indian navy now the operation basically was a part of navy's maritime security operation which comes under something called as operation sankalp all right this is called as operation sankalp again something that we already have discussed multiple times in the previous analysis so as a part of uh, operation sankalp in the gulf of aden and this is something that has now completed 100 days and in this particular scenario it was uh highlighted that there is an importance of the uh, of securing the sea trade routes to prevent an increased cost due to disruptions that have been happening by the pirates and some of the other groups that we have in this particular area and that's why uh, it has been emphasized that indian navy's role in keeping the indian ocean region safe secure and stable is very very crucial 
and we understand that when it comes to the Red Sea crisis, it has led to a very significant increase in the uh, rates, uh, the total rate of you can say any trade and that's why overall we see that it has led to increase of the total cost of the entire trade because what also sometimes means is that many of the companies have been rerouting their ships through the Cape of Good Hope and that's why we understand that this can increase the overall cost altogether of trading through this particular area. So that's why we saw that the Navy intercepted the pirate vessel that was ruined and they had freed almost 17 crew members and had arrested 35 pirates with the help of the marine commandos uh, who were airdropped by the Indian Air Force. So what we see is that after the operation the Navy also had searched and sanitized the ruin and also assessed the sea worthiness that they have and at the same time they also conducted very essential repairs of this also. So they ensured all these things to uh, ensure that the, uh, they can maintain the trade in this particular scenario. Then we also we understand that there are a lot of issues for example there are Houthi rebels, rebels also that are there in that particular area that increases the complexity of the problems that we have in this area. So that's why it's just a continued story from any, everything that we have been discussing in this regard. Now let's come to the main question for today's articles. The first question is examine the multifaceted challenge of tuberculosis control in India and critically analyze the measures taken by the government of India to address this public health crisis. So, so this is basically about TB and we discussed about TB in detail about what is TB and what are the things that the government of India is doing and what are the challenges, the key challenges that we have in India with regard to TB. So those are the things that you will write in this answer. Considering the multifaceted nature of anemia as a public health issue in India, critically analyze the existing strategies aimed at combating anemia among different sections of population. So again, regarding anemia also we discussed the issues and what kind of problems we have and the new study that has showcased certain things uh, with regard to anemia. So what are these areas plus what are the initiatives, what is India doing and what are the key things that we need to do whether it is from the healthcare perspective, socio-economic perspective, nutritional perspective all these things have to be written in this answer. So this is about today's news analysis. Thank you very much for being here.